Okay, Hello, people. everyone. This is Tikva from Homeopathy for Humanity. Sanjay, say hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Sanjay from Homeopathy for Humanity. And I'm a homeopathic practitioner uh, practicing in India since last 30 years. Okay, well, I wasn't going to give such information about myself, but um, I'm old enough to have been doing the same. Um, we today have a special guest speaker. Her name is Brenda Tobin. She is from Massachusetts, and I think she lived in North Carolina. And now she is in Traverse City, Michigan, and she is a homeopathic vet. And she has 22 years of practice experience, and she has some information to share with us today. Welcome, Brenda. Thank you, Tikvan. Thank you, Sanjay, for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm always excited to talk about homeopathy, especially for our animal friends. Um, thanks, to everybody, for joining. So I thought that maybe I would uh, do a little slideshow presentation, just showing some case studies. Uh, I am classically trained in homeopathy, so I uh, do use, you know, one remedy at a time, and uh, I look at the whole, the animal's whole being. I look at the emotional, mental, and physical imbalances of that animal, um, and that helps me choose the correct remedy for them. Um, of course, I, I rely a lot on the caregiver of the animal to provide most of the information. So I always ask them to provide, you know, more detail is better, right? Um, so I was just going to start the slideshow and then, you know, any questions or, or anything. So sounds just kind great. of play it by ear. Yep, okay, sounds cool. great. All right, so. Let me get in here. So I'm going to have to share my screen. Okay. Okay. There we go. Everybody can see that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're doing all creatures great and small. Right. <laughs> So I do, I work with, with all species of animals. Um, but I remember those books when I was a kid, I wanted to be a vet when I was a kid and, uh, I'm glad that homeopathy found me. Okay. So I use the same principles, um, as we do in, in human cases. So I, I just was talking about that. I, I, I look at, you know, like, um, uh, like with likes and then use the remedies that, um, are the totality of the animal's symptoms. So hold on a minute. I need bifocals. So I think I've got to look down and look at my thing. So we're going to just go over some, some case studies here. So this little girl, um, Leah, she came to me in this condition. I work remotely. So, uh, and I, I, I have clients all over the world. So she came to me remotely. I very, very rarely see any clients face to face actually. Um, and I don't recall where she is. She's in the United States. And anyway, this is how the poor little girl presented to me. And she was very sick. She had a fever and of course, um, all this inflammation. And I just wanted to show how I repertize a case. So I am also a, a student of uh, George Vitalis. So I use Vitalis Compass as my um, as my software. And so I just wanted to show because I there's a lot of students on this call, right? Um, so I wanted to show how I repertize the cases and. Um, and this is all for humans, right? Uh, yeah. um, Even when, when we're not students, students, we're interested in people's repertorizations. Yeah, cool. Yeah, true. So <laughs> I look at, um, so everything that I repertize is for humans. And then I just kind of translate it over to animals. So for example, if 
if there was a paw, like a front paw, I would go to hand, right? And then if it was mm -hmm. rear paws, uh, I would go to lower extremities. So this was my repertization for this dog at that time. Uh, and her remedy was arsenicum album. And this is her after. So just to go back, I mean, look at her belly and look at her belly before how red it was. And then even her little face and her ears. Yeah. So oh, now she it, feels better. So much better. So much better. Um, question in one of your rubrics sorry to interrupt um no go ahead uh great thanks in one of the rubrics, not turn you on your camera rubrics, oh sorry okay there um in one of the rubrics i saw that you have mouth thick sensation of right there at the bottom or mouth thick tongue sensation. yeah yeah how yep. would you get that? Yeah, that's curious. How, yeah. How would you? Get that? Yep. So that was the owner was awesome, you know, at being an observer. And she said to me, she said, it's weird. It's like her tongue is really thick. And so I was looking and I was like, okay, wow, that's, that's a rubric in here that I can, I can add in. I only put it at the first degree because it wasn't as severe as say, like, look up at number 15, that's skin inflammation. I mean, she was screaming red, right? So, um, so I added that in there, but that, that came from the, the owner herself. She, this dog is like her child. I mean, she really, um, knows her dog and, and, and came up with that. Um, and I think she said too, it, it felt like, um, when she was looking at her, that there was almost like a thick coating on her tongue as well. So oh, nice. that's how I came with that. But, you know, you get some owners that have zero <laughs> input and, and you're trying to pull it out. Um, kind of your nap mirror owners, right? They're like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this cat here, his name is Jack, and they first came to me um, because he he was really mean to the other cats in the house, really mean. And they ended up, they'd have to lock him in his own room because he would be that mean to the other cats, um, just attacking. So these are the rubrics that I put in for him. And he, he was a talker. He would meow a lot. A lot of my cases come to me. Uh, I would say 99% of my cases come to me, uh, where, where there's vaccinosis. So these animals are yeah. really over vaccinated. Right. Especially um, like the rabies vaccine is supposed to be just really horrible. It's horrible. It really is. So this here is an indoor cat who was heavily vaccinated, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll talk a lot about vaccinosis with my clients. And luckily, you know, as a homeopath, we always go back in time. So we'll go back to when they first got their animal and then we start connecting dots and then we, you know, we'll go through the vaccine history and that's when the people will have their aha moment and go, Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I didn't even realize this, you know? Uh -huh. So, and this cat came to them declawed and yeah, that was a trauma. <laughs> right. Yeah. Trauma. So this cat for this particular time that he saw me, um, he was stramonium and it worked really well. Uh, Another time though, he came to me that she actually seen, she went to a, uh, an animal communicator, which sometimes can be really helpful. Uh, and the animal communicator said that his feet were burning, although they, they didn't feel like they were really hot to the touch to the owner and him being declawed. And I gave him phosphorus for that. And he was fine. And I think, I think, that the owner, it, the 
feet did feel really warm, but the animal communicator described it as they're, they're, they are burning him and phosphorus really helped him. And so that's that. I mean, he's been healthy and happy and I haven't seen him since, which is really good. <laughs> you know, um, it's always that good, like, okay, you don't need to see me anymore. And the people are like, oh, <laughs> so they're so used to allopathy. Mm -hmm. Um, so this guy here, Mr. T, he's an eight year old Springer Spaniel who has severe vaccinosis. Uh, and he started having seizures at the age of four and he started seeing me three months ago, I think. And since being on his remedy, which I chose uh, Calcara Carbonica for him. And he has been seizure free since the remedy. Before the remedy, he was having seizures um, since the age of four, every four to five months. And then the past six months ish before seeing me, it was every month. So now he's been three months seizure free. Mm, that's lovely. Nice work. Thank you. Brenda, and I this, have this is another. You oh. don't mind. Yeah. Sorry. To interrupt. Um, in your method of prescribing and dosing for animals, is it similar like you would do for humans in terms of potency and frequency of repetition of dose, or does it work differently? No, it works the same. So I've taken uh, Professor Viltakis's Levels of Health course, which for me, it, I feel like that has helped me tremendously in prescribing. So I really look at the level of health of the animal and I tend to dose low. I feel like I tend to always start with a 30 C and then kind of figure out where I'm going to go next. If, if at all, uh, in some cases for this guy here, I chose a 12 C. So it was, um, Calcara Cabonica 12 C because his level of health having the severe vaccinosis and then, uh, the seizure activity, he's at a lower level of health. So I chose 12 C. Um, there's going to be a case at the end where you'll see, I'll, I'll talk about it. And we go up the ladder in potency. Um, a lot of these dog or animals come to me to, um, having been prescribed really high potencies and it doesn't seem to work in my experience, like right off the bat, especially. Um, I feel like, I feel like their level of health is so much lower because they're so over vaccinated. I mean, most animals that come to me, if you go back and look at their medical history, just in puppyhood alone, they'll have had like 21 shots. If you're, if you're, if you're going to take all the combo shots and then break it down into one single shot, you know, cause a lot of them have like a five way vaccine um, at least three times in their puppyhood. So that right there is like 15 and then they keep going and then, then, uh, they'll start having the rabies vaccine anywhere between four and six months of age. So I feel like their level of health is lower. So I feel like slamming them with a high potency, especially in the beginning, um, it doesn't really work. I feel like going lower yeah. and assessing is better. Um, Juliana has a question as well. Yeah, Brenda, quick question. Item number 10, I see generalities. I see obesity over here. And I'm looking at the picture of Mr. T. Was this picture taken before or after? He, I mean, he doesn't look like a plump little pigeon to me. So I just, just so that I understand. Sure. Yeah, this was uh, taken before. This is an uh, earlier picture. Yeah. Thanks. And again, like I put that at a, so with this particular software, we go from a zero to a four um, in severity. So like the one, um, and, I've, and the zero is really for, for follow-ups where it's like, okay, no, now we don't see that anymore. So uh, he was at a one. Uh, so not, not a big roly poly, but, um, but he, he, I mean, he's eight years old too, so he got a little chunky. 
And with the same token, okay, it's not always easy in terms of that symptom picture. I think you said cal carb was the remedy you used? Yes. Because I mean, cal carb people can be kind of uh, a particular. And what is it? They're sensitive to flattery. They enjoy flattery. They are a little bit rounded out and they're very particular too. So, I, I mean, to find that remedy, okay, um, because I'm, I could see how you could prescribe it to a human and, you know, you could have that 150 questions with the human and you can bingo it, but to come across that for a dog in terms of a remedy, it's like kudos because, uh, um, you know, especially for vaccinosis, there's other homeopathic remedies that a homeopathic vet would have gone to. Mm -hmm. I yeah. would say that so, that would mean that Brenda's doing better work <laughs> because giving cal car procedures uh, for seizures makes total sense. Mm -hmm. So I'd say Brenda's doing better work than maybe a lot of other people out there. So I am very happy to see that Mr. T is feeling better. He that is. is so good. Okay. I like the way you can rank your things so easily like this. And I like the way you grade your remedies. Nicely, nicely done. Thank you. So this here was, um, I remember this, <laughs> this woman called me in a panic um, at like seven o'clock in the morning, her German shepherd um, was bit by a copperhead snake. So those of you that aren't aware of what a copperhead is, they're primarily in the South and, uh, they are, they're venomous. They, they will kill. So of course she was panicking and I, this woman is a good client of mine. So she bought a kit for me. So <laughs> it's always important. You know, I, I try to encourage people to, to have a, a good, handful of polycrest remedies on board for times like this so this was a lake assist case and um mm -hmm. as you can see within 30 minutes the dog was fine that's great um yeah being able yeah. to handle those emergencies like that is really nicely done very good i'm loving it good blurry Sanjay? picture but oh never mind i was going to go off topic sorry <laughs> oh are you sure yeah no I just get chatty okay that's okay I like that I like chatty so this here blurry picture but this horse had um chronic oh it's like, a horse respiratory. it is a horse look at, I know it's totally blurry but um actually his owner is a naturopath and um so she contacted me because she couldn't he's always had these just snot always with the snot and then bucket you know and and um so he was uh nap mirror i gave him that and just a 30c potency and uh he's been fine ever since that was done a one and done lovely these kitties um the one on the left the gray and white one that's called rodent lip and that's a before and after picture and then the white kitty had sort of an upper respiratory thing going on too. Both of these cases were pulsatilla. Mm. Yeah. And see what I was saying about the, the feral cats, they get this horrible thing in their eyes. I don't even know what it's called because, you know, I'm not a vet, right. But, you know, to be able to observe the symptoms and the behavior and things like that, you know, we can put together the correct remedy, but yeah, I mean, with the eyes all swollen and the goop. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these, this was Pulsatilla. Yeah. It's that, it's that this thing dog, where the uh, nicotating membrane is swollen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yep. that's what we see here. What's it called? So that was Pulsatilla that I gave those cats. So what's that disease called? Oh, you're talking about that. You're talking about that rodent lip. No, what are you talking about? No, the, uh, where the nicotating membrane is swollen and the eyes are all puffy. I don't know what the, what the, um, oh, it's the just plain, no, yeah, I was just wondering if it has like a, a disease name, is there a name disease for it? I don't, 
think so. I mean, it was just to me, just sort of an upper respiratory. And when I, I, I honestly don't even remember if I repertized that case. I just think I saw it and said, okay. Um, and just based on the personality of the cat. Um, Cause cats just die like crazy over here at the feral cats. They get sick in the eyes like this and it just goops everywhere. And then they just up and die. It's got to be more than just a conjunctivitis because they just like, but anyway, that's beside the point. I was just curious. But I, I'll, I'll use a lot of uh, Nat Muir for, for those kind of cases too. So either look at Pulsatilla or Nat Muir for that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, I, I see what you're saying, but the, yeah, conjunctivitis would be more like red, um, itchy. So this dog here was a huge agility dog. Um, and when he came to me, uh, he was just diagnosed with prosthetic cysts and he was dribbling blood on, on like sh the owner would see it on the kitchen floor and the vet, he was diagnosed by the vet and the vet said, well, we have to just um, neuter him. And he was well known and well sought after for his semen. So the, the owner came to me um, and she said, you know, is there any hope? Can, can we try? And of course, right, let's try. So those are the rubrics that I use. And he was also a puzzle killer case. I wanna say within a few days, I mean, it was quick that, that he stopped dripping blood. Uh, he went on after to have sired I think four litters after that and mm. he just recently um passed away but he was I think 14 years old um and then we eventually went to Pulsatilla 200c because the it just came back you know so the 30c wasn't holding so we did a dose of the 200c and then he was absolutely fine, but that was, I think an excellent case, especially for that owner because Very, yeah. um, she didn't want to have to neuter him and, and she ultimately did not have to. Okay, this dog here um, came to me last year and her owner Ooh. is actually a student of homeopathy. Okay. The dog, um, her name is Dixie, and she has had, you know, tons of antibiotics and steroids and all kinds of stuff because of vaccinosis. Owner didn't yeah, know she any looks better. Terrible. Right. Mm -hmm. Owner didn't know any better. So, and she'd actually gone to other homeopaths. So she's had a huge laundry list of remedies thrown at her and all really high potencies. So when she came to me and I was reading through her history, um, it was really sad. And I just said, you know what, we have to take a break and come back and see me. I forget if it was like three weeks or a month or something like we just need to clean slate her, you know, and just start fresh. So this is how she was when she came to me. Um, and this is how she'd been for, for a long, long time. So um, I started her with, um, graphites. So this is a before and after the before is on the left-hand side and the after is on the right-hand side. And you can see too, like how, sorry, um, I meant like even her vulva is like super, super swollen. Um, and now it's not. Yeah, she was miserable, huh? Yep. Poor yeah. thing. So now this is after. And this one, uh, look at her feet before and after. Now these are remarkable results, Brenda. Felicitations. I'm just thinking 
Um, when the owners see these results, okay, obviously you're not using pharmacy on them. What's the reaction from the owners? Oh my gosh. I mean, they want to cry sometimes. Like they will absolutely, and they're always so grateful and they're always, of course, she's a student of homeopathy, um, the owner of this dog, but typically I'm the last to effort. Um, it's in, in, so after they are true believers and then they come to me for everything like my dog just farted the wrong way which I do you know and that's that's a, that's a joke but I mean they really become like transformed and, and they really believe in homeopathy because of course there's no placebo effect in animals right it either works or it doesn't so to see the animal cases, uh, and the same with children, right? I mean, there's no placebo effect in kids either. Um, so this is Dixie now. Like she still has some fur to, to, to go over here, but I mean, what a difference, right? Yeah, so much better. Do you find that people then want treatment for themselves? Yes. Yeah. And, Good. and um, yeah, and so I... I'm able to, to treat humans too. And that's typically how I get my human cases is, is the people will go, Oh my gosh, now how can you help me or a family member? So, um, so that's what happens. But, um, there was something, Oh, I wanted to show you and I couldn't load it on here because I'm Technology is not my thing, but hold on. I wanted to show you um, one last case study, but it's a video. Hold on a second, let me figure this out. Oh, here, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. Okay, now I'm gonna share it again. Okay, so this is a dog that uh, mesorium was actually the remedy, which, you know, I really took Kent's advice um, when he had said, never walk into a case with prejudice. You know, you walk into a case, we all do because we're human and go, ha, that's a, you know, pulsatilla case or whatever. And I feel like my prescribing is so much better since taking this advice from Kent when he said, never go into a case with prejudice and always take each case individually, no matter what that. And then also the levels of health, like incorporating that in, in my prescribing. So this case never in a million years, would I walk into this going, Oh, that's a, um, Mesorium case. So this is because I'm challenged with technology it's actually, you're gonna see the, the after video first and then you're gonna see the before video. But this is pretty amazing. This dog here had um, panocystitis. So that is basically like inflammation of his long bone um, in his front legs. So watch this. Front. Front. So that was only a couple doses of um, Mesurium 30C. We got the wrap on that? I'm curious. Whoops, hold on. Uh, okay. Did you see the video? Were you guys able to yeah. see that? Yeah. Okay. You got the rep for that? I'm curious what, what symptoms you took. Oh, what I repertized? Yep, hold on mm -hmm. a second. Let me just pull it up here. That'll be fun. Give me one second. Oh, I had it. Hold on a minute. Yeah, and then another quick question, Brenda, when you're repertizing, okay, obviously the owner has some symptoms that they can verbally communicate, but I was gonna ask you, what's your process in, in terms of observing the animal 
And do you also have a special process that you deploy when you're treating the animal in order, okay, to be able to repertoise and everything? Uh, yeah, that part, um, hold on a minute, let me just. Whenever I've treated an animal, if it helps, um, I just observe and just see what I see and then observe the behavior and things like that, just like you would with a person. Um, yes. I rely a lot on, you know, on just, you know, objective observation. Because I mean, I do it with my own pets, but I've had them since puppies. So I have a lot of background information on them. And I'm just wondering, because this is quite challenging. Okay, if they go to a homeopath, okay, Brenda, for example, she hasn't seen the, the animal before. So she has to go by what the owner says, and then also through observing. So that that's uh, quite a task. I was wondering yeah. if she has any tricks to share with us. Yeah, what are your tricks, Brenda? I know, I don't really have, <laughs> I don't know. You know what, I, all I can tell you, and I understand what you're saying, and I don't have any, I don't feel like I have any tricks. I just feel like I've always been in tune with animals, They're always, since I was a kid. And and I don't know if that's just part of it. I, I can read animals pretty well. Uh, I kind of have a gift for gab so I can kind of pull things out of people too without, without influencing, you know, mm -hmm. um, th there are times when it can be challenging and I just want to like, you know, <laughs> hit my head on my desk, like, ah, oh, I'm not like, this is, this is tough, you know? Um, but I really try to encourage the owners like please when i give you the questionnaire to, to start with that's so i start with a questionnaire and i tell them i'm like don't be embarrassed because so, i feel like some people are embarrassed like i wrote too much information i'm like no that's great like write the book <laughs> you know give me all the information that i can that, that you can offer and then i go from there and when i go through the questionnaire i mean i'll highlight and this is just how we're trained, right? We just go through and highlight and, and pick out bits and pieces. And then, mm -hmm. and then it's further. I mean, my, my initial consults last between an hour and two hours. Uh, so it's a, just going through the, the questions, you know, I, I think it's funny because when you go back in your life and you, and you start connecting the dots of, of your own life, I used to be a paralegal years ago. So I don't know if that part, you know, uh, that training helps me too with, with asking questions and pulling things out. I, I, I don't know, but I wish I could, uh, yeah, I, I don't have like a, no two cases are the same. I don't have um, an exact like science. So maybe, maybe, um, I can just say that I, I know animals. I love animals and I can connect and, and read. So this was Elvis. This was the dog with the pano, uh, panocystitis. Mm -hmm. And so let me go back to, I can go back into the, um, I think, hold on. And I'm sorry, I mean, it didn't really answer your question, but um, Brenda, you have a question here about which repertory, which software are you using? So I use Viltaka's Compass. So let me share the screen. Oops. I can't spell compass, never mind. Yeah, two S's. Oh, well. It's okay. It's Bethuka's right. compass. Okay, let me. I mean, I could barely type, you know. Um, I'm trying to. I 
It's not going into, oh, will it go into there? Can you see that? So it says we'll talk as compass and then are you seeing the same screen? That yeah, I have there we on? go. Mm -hmm. So this here is Elvis. This is the dog with the panocystitis. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, like phosphorus was the top remedy. But when I read about it, so, okay, let's go with this. So this is what I ultimately chose and that's what worked. Okay, he, he had that once and so these were my notes. It worked beautifully for the panel, no more pain, no more limping since he's been on the remedy. I told her to stop it and then see that the owner, she started working. She wanted to work on um, her own stuff, but hold on. So, so, you know, when we look at this remedy, there's only, I put in nine symptoms and only three, but so when I open it up, this Viltakis compass, I'm able to look at George Viltakis's um, Materia Medica, Boricky Kent, Allen. Then I have also, I have Clark and I have Herring. So oftentimes I will look at, um, so one, two, three, four, five, six, like six different materia medica is when I'm trying to choose a remedy. Um, so that's what I did with, with this case. I went in and looked at other materia medicas and then it was like, okay, this really fit um, because of the long bone. Oh, and I think he had lumbar pain too. Uh, and just very like intolerant to touch, um, but also the tibia, the long bone is affected. And so this was just a 30 C potency. Um, oh, you had a question. Um, somebody was asking um, how you give remedies to animals, whether or not you make it into a spray bottle or if you just put it in their water or whatnot. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. was a question there. So I typically, what I will do is uh, instruct the client to give the remedy uh, via a dry dose if they can't. So I always say, you know, put it in the cap and if you can open the dog's mouth or even the cat's mouth and just kind of chuck the remedy to the back of their throat, hold their nose, point their nose to the ceiling and they should swallow it. It's very sweet, right? If they can't do that, then I'll teach them how to make an aqueous solution and give it to them that way you know, with a dropper if they can. Uh, of course, we're always instructed not to give with food. However, I treat all species of animals. I'm not gonna stick my hand in a pig's mouth or, you know, sometimes even horses, it's difficult. So I will put it in a tiny smidge of food, just something a little, something soft. And it hasn't made a difference in, in healing, they still, recover quite nicely. So I do instruct, don't give it in their meal, but kind of worst case scenario, then they can do it, you know, with just a little piece of food. I don't really like it in the water dish only because I feel like they're not gonna, they might get the dose throughout the day, but you know, what if you have a pulsatilla case for instance, and they're just thirstless. So it's kind of hard to get that water, um, get them to drink out of their water bowl, for instance, or if it's a multi animal household, then, you know, I just want to be certain that that dog, for example, is actually getting the remedy. So I like dry dosing first and then go to aqueous solution and then worst case scenario, put it in a little pinch of food, a little treat. Did that answer your question? Yep. Okay. He's good. So that's what I have to share for cases. I've got many, many more cases, but that's what I kind of wanted to, you know, I, I just start with some and, um, the, the dog, um, 
Dixie. So we started her with a 30 C and just as time went on, I don't change remedy if it kind of peters out. So, and if she still fits that, she still fit a graphite picture, but say the 30 C she was not, there was no more improvement. So then I would go to a 200 C and uh, that's how I work with changing potency. So are there any other questions? Yeah, I had a question. I noticed um, you include a couple of mind rubrics and I wanted to ask you, in humans, like for example, mind biting people would be really unusual, right? Extremely rare, we would pay a lot of attention to it. But for a puppy who's teething and they're biting people, is that something that you would take into account or would you say it's not really important because they're teething or they think that they're playing? Like how do the mind rubrics work for animals? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. So if they were teething, then I wouldn't take that into consideration. And also breed specific. So sometimes they'll be a breed that it's like, you know what, that's just part of their breed, you know, so I'm not going to include that. I would include if it was something unusual for that dog and not necessarily breed specific. Thank you. I can go into a couple aggression cases. I got a lot of aggression cases too. So, you know, where we're dealing more with mind. Um, and these are almost always, uh, vaccinosis cases. I have, I have a funny story of a case of another yet again, yard feral cat. Every <laughs> once in a while, the city comes by and they pick up as many cats as they can find and they spay them and they vaccinate them. And then they return them to the same location. And one of the cats who'd been hanging around our yard, she was so vicious when I found her and she'd had um, I could tell that she'd been picked up by the city she'd been missing for a number of days but that wasn't totally bizarre because you know she'd had her ear clipped and her stomach was shaved and she had suture marks so we had know obviously that what had happened um, so I took her symptoms she was so vicious and um, I gave her some latticis and it really calmed her down it really did because, you know, she'd had a surprise hysterectomy and she'd been vaccinated and she was vicious, but vicious no longer after. But I did put medicine in water for her because, mm -hmm. you know, she's not, she's a feral cat. Yep. So I just set out a bowl, you know, but and I, I, for humans, I only do water dosing also. So, but I wasn't okay. going to touch that cat and say, let's wrap you in a towel and let's put a pellet in your mouth. I'm like, here, we'll just set out water for you, which is a little harder now because now we have a pond. Anyway. I yeah, digress. in that situation, yeah. I would definitely just put it in the water, you know, if. Um... Do you remember, Tikwa? Hmm. Um, what we, we have to stay for my German Shepherd when oh. you are here? And yeah. he was eating tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And he, he was said tomato, he is eating tomato and this is passive for ferramet. Right? And uh, ferramet was prescribed. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And he was a really big, big dog. Yeah, he was a beauty. <laughs> And he was a German Shepherd? German Shepherd, yeah. And That's what uh, I have. I don't actually, he expired a couple, uh, couple of years back. But he, he sure was, did. Uh, he lived for near about 12 years. Wow. And actually he had got an injury and which from which he haven't recovered and then i think he had some uh, brain or say, paralysis type symptom and then he died yeah i mean he had gangrene with maggots and he had neurological symptoms and we did our best we did we tried our hardest 
We really did. Yeah. Right, Sanjay? Yeah. We worked hard to try to save Rex. Oh. I've got pictures on my computer somewhere of his of his feet. <sighs> Terrible. Yeah, in German Shepherds, it's hard to um, because you know most of them are predisposed to a lot of like gut issues and. So it's hard because in vaccinosis, one of the uh, number one symptoms of vaccinosis is allergies. So, you know, that's a common thread is that they have these allergies and then the people go to the vet for that. And then the vets prescribe antibiotics and steroids. And then we go on this vicious cycle of, um, of that. But then if you have a dog, you know, like a German shepherd or, um, bulldogs you know they come to mind they have a lot of skin issues anyway and um so it's hard um i have a german shepherd too but um he's not vaccinated <laughs> he had one parvo shot and one distemper shot from his breeder and that was it um so let me show you this case here um this is a one-year-old hold on a minute Oh, um, Vijay Sri wants to know what you gave. Oh, it was Nat Mir, Vijay Sri. It was Nat Mir. So this here is the one-year-old Great Pyrenees and oh. he's been over vaccinated and- I don't have a picture of an animal to look at. No, sorry. Oh, there's no animal to picture. Oh, okay. no, I was just, I, I know, okay. right? <laughs> okay. So here we go with the mind. That's why I wanted to pull this one up. And that was it. All I did was, was mind. I mean, he was, it was a clear case of Belladonna. So, but this dog would chew holes in the walls. Oh, uh, he would, yeah, scrape his teeth on the floors. Um, he would bite and really scare the owners. They had, <laughs> or they have like a pen in their kitchen for him. And sometimes he would scare them so bad that they would get in the pen. Like it's like an X pen. So <laughs> that's <laughs> terrible. Is, right. So um, he was on Belladonna and, you know, when we did our follow-up, uh, she said, I don't know. I don't think it worked. And then she said, well, I don't know, maybe it did, but in all honesty, we really didn't give the remedy. And I think they gave like one dose or something. And I wanted a couple low do low potency doses in him. And then we met back like a couple of weeks later and she said, oh my gosh, completely different dog. Um, he He's so different and still different now, like better. No, more, no longer chewing holes in the walls and no, no longer biting. Um, but so, you know, to answer the question about the mind, um, so look at here, like obstinate children. So he's a puppy really. So I'll often use children rubrics if I have a younger animal. Well, that I'm working yeah, on. I mean, it is a baby animal, so it's really kind of the same. Yeah, for sure. And he would too, he would, he would hide, he would hide a lot. And so he really was a beautiful clear-cut case of belladonna so that's really nice i love it this is fun. Praveen, Praveen has a question Praveen, turn on your camera and you can ask Praveen is there yeah yes yes sir uh, i have a question uh, when uh, we'll treat large animals like uh, buffalo cows the uh, acute cases like uh, uh, abdomen uh, distension uh, due to overfeeding or uh, some poisonous plants that if they uh, had uh, that time sudden distension of abdomen we can see that's the uh, emergency otherwise we cut uh, cut and open its uh, stomach we, we can release the gas otherwise is is there any remedies to uh, treat in that condition Mm -hmm. because uh, I am getting more cases here in my area. Oh, yeah. Boninghausen talks about that in his 
that's the writings about every colchicum. He says mm -hmm. the colchicum is a near specific for that kind of bloat. Okay. Large animal has that uh, fatal uh, distension of uh, abdomen. If they are not treated uh, quickly, the animal dies. Yeah, mm -hmm. so Bodinghausen tells us his story about how all the things on his farm and neighbor farms in the springtime, they eat too much clover, et cetera, et cetera. And that he gives colchicum and it gives very, very fast results. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more thing, madam. Uh, I have, uh, since from last three, four years, I am seeing infertility uh, in large animals, uh, especially in buffaloes. Uh, it uh, could be the nutritional deficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I know that the, here they are using more uh, the scientific way they are saying uh, than uh, artificial insemination. I think uh, that may be a cause for infertility. Mm. Any uh, thoughts on uh, these things? Yeah, How we I can mean, maintain? Yeah, that that's tough too because you know I would start with the, the conditions, you know, the living conditions, and then nutrition. And then see, um, you know, look at pulsatilla. That's a good female remedy. Um, but I would start with, um, I would start with, with nutrition. That's, that is hard. Uh, I used to, I used to breed Great Danes um, and I was a naturally reared breeder. So they all we're not vaccinated and I rough fed and, and they were treated homeopathically, you know, when needed. And I know that my girls always had huge litters, like 11 to 17 puppies in a litter. So I would, I would, you know, and I always try to tell people too, that the more you use homeopathy, the less you're going to need it. Right. Because it always brings the body back into balance. Right. So I would start with, with um, the nutrition and then just kind of take case by case, you know, what did you say? The buffalo, water buffalo? Buffalo, buffalo. Yeah. So, and, and see if you can, you know, take one case at a time and see where that particular female, uh, if you can prescribe a remedy and see if she'll turn around that way and just come back in a balance. And pulsatilla too. I mean, it has a great affinity on on hormones. The sepia does too. So if they're, you know, really cranky, then maybe consider that. Look at that remedy and see if it fits. Okay. And uh, I am getting more uh, complications in uh, skin diseases up uh, small animals like a cat, dog, uh, any suggestion in this uh, particular? So I'll get a lot of skin cases too. And I do believe that it is, you know, the, the root cause is from vaccinosis because then that'll cause allergies. And then we have the disruption of the gut because then they're prescribed antibiotics, steroids. So I always try to also support with again, good nutrition, I'll ask, what are you feeding your cat or your dog? We always go over the nutrition. And then I will offer some supplements that will help build the gut. So typically it'll be like a good bovine colostrum and a good probiotic to start. And then whatever remedy. And again, I take each case individually. So I have skin cases every single day from all over the world. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. All these animals are being over vaccinated and it's the same vicious cycle, you know? So I will take every case individually and, and see what remedy, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of like arsenicum cases and sulfur and, and things like that, but you want to, 
my advice is to take the case separately and see what remedy best fits that animal. Um, I have a question. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, when you say, uh, you know, and you use a lot, you see a lot of elements after vaccination. Do you see elements after flea and tick medication? Because I have a golden retriever puppy who's the sweetest, most passive loving dog. And I think I made the mistake of allowing the vet to give him flea and tick medication. And I saw the change in behavior the next two days immediately. He started biting and he was resource guarding, nothing like what he was before. I mean, the effect did last. It lasted only a couple of days, but it was soon after the medication. So I was just wondering if you saw those effects as well, or if they're longer lasting, or should, you know, I do something about it, uh, even though the effects did last. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, and when I have a consult, you know, the initial consult with the client, we'll also go over flea and tick and heartworm medication. All of those have side effects. And most, if not all, have behavioral side effects. You know, some of them cause seizures. So we will also go over that. And yeah, so there's safe, effective alternatives that you can use for flea and tick prevention. Um, there's uh, different sprays uh, coming to mind. There's one called Kin in Kind, K-A-N and K-I-N-D, Kin in Kind. Um, that's a good brand. It's safe. It is effective. So um, I have something to say along those yeah. lines. Uh, a friend mm -hmm. of mine who has a farm, she started using Bach flower crab apple to get rid of fleas and ticks that were really, really prevalent and, you know, becoming a major problem. And she said it worked really, really well. So you might yeah. want to look along the lines like that too. Crab apple. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, but these things are so toxic and then, you know, it goes through their skin and it goes through their system and they lick themselves and it's a problem. But of course, we do want to have clean and hygienic animals in our homes. Yeah. That's when I had my aha moment was this is going back, I don't know, 20 years or so. And I had Great Danes and I used Frontline on them. And I remember yelling at my kids, like, don't hug the dogs, don't hug the dogs. I just put the front line on them. And literally the light bulb went off in my head. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you're poisoning the dog. animal and you're scared you're gonna poison your kids. So yeah, yeah. it's time to make a change. Yep. <laughs> yep, and I did, but it was at the moment. I was like, wow, yeah. And, you know, I, I, I used to vaccinate. So my story is when I was nine years old, I used to have a paper route. And on that paper route, there were two Irish wolfhounds. And I saw these dogs and I was in awe. And I was like, oh, someday I'm going to get them. And then shortly thereafter, I, I met a Great Dane. And I was like, oh, there's my dog. I'm going to get a Great Dane. So this is at nine years old when I was 25. I finally got a Great Dane and I was gonna take the best care of that dog ever. So I brought him to the vet for everything and I fed him pedigree, which is a horrible food, but the vet said it was a really good food. And um, so I did it and I lost my dog at three years old. He ended up getting lymphoma and, um, and he died. And it was, I was horrified, I was crushed. Um, it was, it was the worst experience. And, but because of that experience, um, he opened up my world. And so I, I was like, I've got to, um, I've got to do better, you know? So I started learning and I started learning about nutrition and homeopathy right at the same time. So, and, and I haven't stopped. And I honestly feel like our animals come to us as teachers and he was my teacher dog. So if it weren't for him, I wouldn't be where I, I am today. And he, he sent me on this journey and, um, and that's, that's how I became a homeopath. So, um, yeah, it's, 
It's interesting. Brenda, Anybody it's the else? same thing with me. They don't call him the heartbreak hound for nothing. I had Curry. He was my first hound. And I would have walked him home from Gatineau if I needed to. And I had such a connection with that dog. It was just so uncanny. Mm -hmm. And it was the same way. You trust the veterinarians. And these were conventional veterinarians. So you think you're doing the right thing. And that's mm -hmm. when I realized that not all vets are the same. And that's when I started, you know, getting in with DNM and, I, I, and uh, the whole new world of homeopathic vets, holistic vets, the true meaning of integrated medicine. So now they can't pull the wool over your eyes. And I wish I would have known then what I know now, because it makes a huge world of difference. That was my journey as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I love hearing uh, people's aha moment stories where they kind of like the light bulb goes on and they like, yeah, I love those stories. Thanks for sharing. So I had an Irish wolfhound case that comes to mind, speaking of Irish wolfhounds, and the woman came to me as a last ditch effort. This dog had um, spinal stenosis and she, I, she didn't tell me this and I'm really glad she didn't tell me this, but I, if I hadn't helped the dog, then she was going to put him down. So, um, he, she came to me, I repertized his case and it wasn't until, so I'm asking questions, asking questions. And, it, and I said, does he, so he's in pain. And I said, does he choose to lay on soft bedding or the hard floor? She said the weirdest thing he loves to lay on the hard floor. I said, ah, Nat Muir. So I, I prescribed him Nat Muir. And as I'm talking to her about how to administer the remedy, she, in conversation, which I never would have thought to ask this, but she said something about, oh, and he loves um, his favorite treat, the little mint puffs, like the peppermint puff minty things. And I said, oh my gosh, you can't give him those. Not on that map, especially not on that mirror, no mint. And I said, he's gonna hate me, but you can't give him those little puffy treats anymore while he's on the remedy. Uh, so she gave him the remedy and he's fine. He even um, went back to the chiropractor and chiropractor saw a huge difference. And ultimately, thankfully she, didn't have to put him down and he's still around today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's now can, he's back to eating his little puffy mints, but um, I thought that that was just interesting about, <laughs> you know, it, questions that you don't think to ask an animal client, do they eat mint? So are there any other questions? Recently me and, uh, recently me and uh, Sanjay sir uh, treated uh, this one, uh, tick fever. You get a wonderful result in that condition. The platelets also goes down and uh, bleeding uh, inside the stomach and intestine. And within a span of a week, we get a good result, ma'am. I tried and dog also. So you saw a good result with what remedy? Marxwala I given. And uh, that um, I think uh, we had also used uh, asophoetida for the uh, foul, offensive smelling um, the uh, uh, gases. Yes. Kindly repeat what you said, uh, the remedy name. I didn't quite catch it. Asafoetida. Hmm. Uh, can you type one minute? Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. I think I have a case presentation. Uh, just I will check if I have in my phone. This is amazing because you, you customarily get to know the common 50 remedies and the 100 remedies, 
Okay, and I'm hearing some remedies here I haven't heard of. So thank you for sharing. I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, and, and uh, Trisha has a question. Okay, um, man, I'm gonna have to see you. <laughs> so, so here's my question. Um, I and I'm not gonna ask a diagnostic question. I'm gonna ask a working with question. Um, I have a kitty who has had skin issues. I posted a little bit in the chat with him forever and he only got his shelter shots and he actually came from a drug lab arrest. Like they arrested a drug dealer and he was with a whole bunch of other kitties who all, all most, most of them all were killed, but, but we saved him. And he has had skin issues forever. And this is going on seven years now. And initially we did traditional vet stuff and he was on steroids and he was on antifungals and all that. And my question is, um, He's not now, you know, of course, and hasn't been back since. And he has raw diet and gets, you know, gut healing herbs and all kinds of other things. And I see a chiropractor and we muscle test for homeopathy and herbals, but still chews himself to death, skin issues and skin allergies. So my question is, do you work with people? Yes, with that. But also, like, I'm intuitive and I'm trained as a medical intuitive, but it's really hard on my own animals. Go figure. Um, but if I'm talking with somebody and they say, well, it might be this and this and this, and they can narrow it down, I can usually feel intuitively, okay, it's the second one or it's the third one. And are you willing to work with someone like that? Because some doctors won't. They're like, they, their, their view is the view and that's it. But I like to do, I use my guides and talk and stuff. It's just that being so close to your own animals, it's tricky. I can, I can do it so easily for other people's animals, but not my own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had I've had some clients that are like that. I mean, I feel like I'm intuitive too, but I also feel like I've had I've had six years of formal education in homeopathy, and there is a science behind it, and there's a technique um, that you know I I respect, and and although I I do respect intuitiveness, um, but I. You know, I feel like if, if, and I've had cases like this, if there are two remedies, for example, that it's like, oh, it could be this and it could be this, then if you want a muscle test, you know, then, then you could do that. Um, but, but knowing that there is definitely, you know, a, a science behind what we do, um, um, I know that there are some, I don't know if they're homeopaths or what, but there are some that will, you know, that's all that's the only way that they'll prescribe period without even taking the case and um i don't believe in that i believe that there's you know there is a method to this but there's also some like intuitive like you know when somebody had asked before about um animals and is there any you know there's and I kind of feel like this with homeopathy too. There's no, like, there's no straight line, you know, there's always uh, shades of gray. So, um, so I feel like I would, I be more, I'm more comfortable like taking the case and doing it that way. And then if there's a couple remedies that are right on the fence, then for sure you can do that and do like a mus muscle testing yeah. for it. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say that. I don't muscle test. I just want to say that I I'm intuitive and I'm very good because I can test something in my mind and then check it on the bioresonance and it'll come up exactly what I just said. So I, I know I can do that, but, but I appreciate what you're just saying. So if you narrow it down to, I, I trust you hundred percent too. That's why I'm like, I would go and see you as a client, but, and refer people to you, but I also want to have, I want to have the, you know, are you willing to let me intuit some things too? So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that a lot of homeopaths, including myself, tend to be rather intuitive. And um, but you know, but we have to do the work and do the science-based work, you know, and, and I, I might come across as being like very methodical about how we have to do this, that, and the other, and, and things just in the right way according to all the rules and applications. But you know, but being intuitive does not prevent us from following all the directions and staying within the framework. I just mm -hmm. wanted to say that. <laughs> Thank you. So we can get better results that way, even though we're intuitive. Right. And, and I, I agree with you and I agree with, you know, and that's why in the beginning I was saying, you know, I, I, um, I'm really happy that, 
uh, I read that passage from James Kent about don't go into a case with prejudice, you know, don't go in, hey, it's an Atmere case, you know, and here you go. Like, unless it's an emergency that you're like, okay, we don't have time. <laughs> like, this is definitely, you know, Natme or Belladonna, for instance, or something. But if we have some time to repertize the case, go in and repertize the case and do it right. And so many times um, since doing that, I, I go in with that prejudging, hmm, look, this is a, you know, whatever case. And then I repertize it correctly. And then I'm like, wow, never would think of that. Like the mesereum that I use for that panosystitis case, never in a million years would I have thought off the top of my head that it would be that remedy. And it was, and it helped that dog with um, just a couple um, doses of that remedy. And it was done in a 30C, so. As we should expect. And that's very good work. And that's what we should be seeing. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm liking that. I don't have the chat open, so I can't okay. see it. Um, Karina says, is somebody at homeopathy without borders? Oh, okay. Go ahead and talk, Karina. <laughs> I, I, I see you. I, I just couldn't um, place you. And, you know, you're so friendly. You're so sweet. I'm like, I've heard her voice. I know I've seen her. But, yeah, I think I attended one of the, or I, I at least viewed one of the Homeopath Without Borders seminar, and I think you were there. Yeah. And yeah, you're in I Canada. Who, who's at Homeopathy Without Borders? I, I was. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. I, I'm not a homeopath, just for the record. I would, I'm in the closet, man. <laughs> but <laughs> like, I have huge respect for you all. And, and I don't, I don't want to be a practitioner. Like I would actually want to ask if you are a lay person and you still want to know stuff just to be educated and to actually be able to inform other people or even, you know, like I would help with the legislation and stuff too, because I'm good at explaining things. But where would you start? Would you need to be? Uh, to follow a practitioner path. I just, I don't want to get into the health. I feel like our climate right now is I'll just educate stuff, but I don't want to do, I don't do bioresonance on other people's paths. I don't do any herbalism and I know a ton, but I don't want to help because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to be practicing medicine without a license because I don't have any of that stuff. I just, I do my little bioresonance someone, sometimes on someone for free and then I'll send them to a, a chiropractor, a holistic vet, a homeopath. I can find one, you know, to help them out because I want to help people but I'm not, I don't charge money. And I just, well, I'll even give them the remedies for free. If I have the remedies, I just give it to them for free, but You're, I want to refer them to somebody Where else. are you? Where are you I'm, in America? I'm in Florida. Okay. And I see like my holistic vet is uh, Dr. Marlene Siegel, but she's never used homeopathy. She's kind of far mm -hmm. away. Like I literally go to the chiropractor down the street because he muscle tests. So I'll do it on the machine, bioresonance. Then I'll take in the scan and he'll muscle test it. Then we'll get some remedies together and stuff. And 99% of the time it works fabulous. And he doesn't charge. So it's like, it's a free visit. I already have the remedies and I just need to know what to give. So Because what I think you could probably get away with is just giving homeopathic advice, which is pretty much the way people have to work in the United States anyway. So I think that you should be able to even, you know, just without like registering or whatnot, be able to give advice and, you know, charge whatever fee for your time. If you feel comfortable with that, I think you should be fine. If they, to, if they want to learn more, who do they study with? Who do they study homeopathy with? I literally know, I have no idea. I mean, I know. So it depends what kind of program you want. Um, there's a great school in Toronto. They also offer online education. So you could do it in the comfort of your own home. Um, if you're willing to, you know, to go the full route. They have an uh, introduction to homeopathy, which is just a, a few months course. If you just want to learn homeopathy for yourself and your family, and maybe just for friends, that's just a few months course. You don't have to do the whole uh, three and a half years to get certification. Um, they're an amazing school. Love them, love them. They're, they're super nice. So if you want to go that route and reasonable pricing is um, to enroll. Uh, uh, the other thing you can do is you can team up with a wellness coach or a holistic practitioner in your area. Maybe say, you know, this is what I want to do. I'd like to come in a few times a week when I have time 
or I can do it online. I can consult in homeopathy and maybe do that kind of advice too and, and work with somebody, um, you know, and do it your way. I think the one thing about homeopathy, which is great, is we can find the way we want to do it. We can teach, we can practice, we could volunteer. You know, there's so many different avenues to do it. But yeah, if you're talented and you've got the interest, go ahead. There's so many options. Yeah, we, we need more homeopaths out here. We do. Sure. I mean, look yeah. at look at the way that everything's going downhill so badly all the way around the world. Ooh, we have entered into the deep twilight zone. We need to look at paths. One of the things that I've realized is ever since DNM, because most of our vets are homeopathic vets, you get to know all of this stuff. So you end up being the go-to person in the neighborhood. And then, you know, you walk your dogs at the same time. So you end up chatting with each other and you share the stories. Oh, that word, what do you give for your dog? Oh, you use this, you don't use that. And then it, the word just starts to spread and then people tend to use it. And they realize that it's remarkable results because I had one neighbor here and she had an old dog, but I swear to God, I could tell that dog had thyroid problems and some other things, but, and there was a cruel vet, shouldn't practice, told her that she needed to put down the dog. And she came to me with her dog because I knew Mimi, okay? She just lives maybe about two, two houses down, Veronique. And then I looked at her and I says, well, that's what the vet said. I see you're not ready for it. You want to give something a try? Sure, shooting. It was Nux Vomica. She went into the garbage and ate the leftover skin of the ham. Okay, that came out. The dog was bouncing around. So she says, my God, you're a miracle worker. No, simple little remedies. And the nice thing also is that it opens up, you know, to great friendships and the sense of community also. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Oh. Do you all, since you mentioned the vaccine stuff several times, do you have resources that you recommend to people for education? And I'm actually, well, mostly talking about animals, but I like to hint around on the other one too. And I, oh, I don't touch it with anybody these days. But with animals, I usually will try to like at least inform people not to over, not to get tighter testing and not to over vaccinate them. But is there, are there resources you refer to? I basically, I'm asking, how do I <laughs> oppose the brainwashing? Because people are so, even if it's an indoor animal and never goes outside, they still over vaccinate. And I, I know better, but, but I had a loss years ago. So that's why I know better. Yeah, I wouldn't know. I mean, MVIC has always been a good source for human vaccination. But Brenda, what do you recommend for um, vaccine education for animals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, so um, uh, maybe we Dr. can put Dick it in the Aaron, chat box. Yeah, he's got a lot of information out there about over vaccinating. I do a lot of webinars for Dogs and Actually magazine. I recently did one about vaccinosis, um, but let me see. Uh, but Dr. Pickering, he's he's got. Oh, Pickering, I know him. Yeah. Is it clicking? I don't know. No, it didn't. Pit, um, Pickering, I got. I know who he is. Yeah, I yeah. know this guy. He's a old oh. friend of my dad's. Oh, awesome. That's great. Oh, maybe I'm just, I don't know. I spelled it wrong, of course. Everything. Uh, yeah. I can find him on Facebook. Yeah, yeah so he's he, really nice. No, I would start there. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna yeah, look up how to spell there. his name right. Oh, you got it. Okay, thank you, Brenda. You're welcome. Yeah, so and he's also, really nice. Um, I've known him. I met him when I was younger, and he's an old friend of my dad's. And definitely, he is a real go-to person for for um, Pitker and is he? He's a uh, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And that's another vet, Dr. Don Hamilton. Um, I would start there and and see. So um, 
I can, can I put my website in the chat box? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I am so, so going to refer somebody to you who has one of the worst cases of allergies and skin issues on a cat that I've ever seen in my entire life. I mean, it's, I, I cried when I saw these photos. So mm -hmm. I would absolutely love, that's that lady in Alabama. Um, and someone posted someone else too. So I'll look both of those, but I would love to refer her to somebody because that cat, oh, she needs help. And she's out. Brenda's here to help you. Yeah, I would love to refer because if you can help that cat, this lady, she does rescue and she would be over the moon. Ah, uh, well, thank you. The yeah, only thing I wanted to say um, also what we learned, and I got this from Dr. Pat Jordan, who's uh, uh, homeopathic, that she was teaching us, okay, Ilya Mechnikov, I left a link there. He's the forefather of immunity. He's the one that talked about um, innate and acquired immunity and herd immunity. So when we start to learn a little bit more as to biologically how our immunity works and how to strengthen and enhance it, that's when people start to get a little bit of the aha moment as to, ah, oh, I'm putting synthetics into an organic body, but when they inoculate me, they have heavy, heavy metals in there that diminish my immunity. OK, that's when they're beginning to make that connection and, and start to understand, because especially, of course, Trish, we understand today that bats word is like a four letter word and there's a lot of hot controversy over it. And that's a good question. Is there a Facebook, a Facebook group that everybody's connected with? Because this was really a cool presentation. If you, you go to our, um, um, do you have Instagram? No, I cut that out. I cut, I cut out Twitter. I cut out Instagram. I just kept Facebook. You know, okay. I tried to diminish a little bit. I mean, I'm connected with Brenda. Okay. So. If you go to, um, if you go to Facebook, our Facebook page is, um, it's got this logo on it. Or Sanjay, can you show her the logo? And it's yes, Homeopathy for Humanity. Okay. And Sanjay's gonna show you what our logo looks like because somebody else has used the same, what's it called? But we have like, I don't know, quite a few. When um, twice a week, we're doing various activities like this. You can, look, you can look at that. Homeopathy for Humanity, and it's a dot org, right? Um, yeah, but we don't currently have our website up right oh. now. But yes, we're still here, though. But you go to our YouTube, and you see we have a lot of videos, but it's all about humans and homeopathy. But we have a lot of yeah, videos, but, um, and we're trying to put out a lot more content. You, you talked asked. about that, Sanjay. Juliana is asking about if uh, there is any group that Brenda has so we can connect. Uh, right. Yeah, Brenda, what's your group uh, information? Okay, so my Facebook business page is just Wellness Matters. I think you can get to it at Animal Homeopath. But I also have a group that I just started and it's uh, called... <laughs> Hold on. I think it's uh, homeopathy for animals and their people. Let me pull it up. Yeah, pull it up so we can click on it. Yeah, there we go. Let me put it in. Oops. This is my Facebook group uh homeopathy homeopathy for animals and their people okay great thank you for sharing that you're welcome children is going i think thank you so for uh, attending 
Yes, thank you for attending. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. I have to get on with my day back here on the West Coast, but thank you. That was really, really interesting. You do a lot of good work, Brenda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye and thank now. you so much, Brenda, thank for you. coming and joining us today and giving this informational presentation and chatting with us and everything. Thank you very, very much. Thank you fun. so much for inviting me. Thank you. I yep. really appreciate it. And then this will be available for people to watch on the, on the YouTube channel um, if you want to refer somebody else to it. Awesome. Great. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have that have our page, our uh, Facebook page, and uh, we will share this video uh, recording over there. And um, you can also share. You can go. Tikwa, uh, can you uh, share that link of the homeopathic, uh, homeopathic for Humanity page, Facebook? I can try. <laughs> it's so hard to, to use multiple screens for me, you know? I know, me too. I get lost. You can just share. Uh, yeah, just give me a second. I'm going to get to it. I'm working on it. Okay, so how do I share it? You do, do not have an option to share. Oh, how exactly do you want me to share it? I don't understand. I have it up, I have it pulled up on my Facebook. And now what? Close share, all of your windows your and share screen, horizontal score bar highlighted in green on the bottom, right in the center. You should see it. Or just copy paste the link into the uh, chat box and right. that should be good enough. Okay. And get right back to the right Zoom page. There we go. I sent right. the link. I, I sent the it. link. Well, oh, thanks, thank Sanjay. You. <laughs> I, I have the, you know, you're so much more efficient the with these things than I am. Open it. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Um, and then you said that we can share a screen. Who can share? Actually, I cannot share my screen because I am on a different monitor. Well, I'm not sure that okay, I can share try. my screen at all. <laughs> oh, dear. Let me check if uh, this works. I mean, it's giving me Chrome and then it's telling me that I'm on Zoom and that's all it's telling me. I it's guess if, okay, hang on. Let's give this a second. I might have it. I might have it. You guys see my screen? Oh. It's coming. You're good. Finally. It's okay. <laughs> it's gonna, oh, it's so slow. Well, eventually it should load. I think uh, poor connection. Yeah. You might have another window open and it could be searching for which window you want open. 
<laughs> it says that low system resources are affecting my audio quality now too. Oh, here it oh, comes. Here we go. Oh, login. Where is uh, it's loading? Yeah, it's loading. Yeah, maybe once everybody's off, then you'll have more. Yeah, internet yeah. is a bit okay. slow. Yeah. I and mean, we have decent internet where we live, but let me yeah. try then. You try. Oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Nice. And that's so, the Facebook page? Yeah. Yeah. Just go and search for homeopathy for humanity page. But it has it's this one. There's more than one because people have used the same. Uh, Send the link also. Just uh, you right. can use that link. You can get the direct. Praveen Kumar can, has already fixed our problem. He Close sorted the issue. Box. Okay, now, I'm like, <laughs> now I'm just stuck here waiting for the my camera to come back so that I can stop okay. sharing my page. I'm sorry, guys. I actually okay. have to hop off because I've got a case at two o'clock my time. So I'm going to yeah. hop off. But thank you so much. And thank okay, you. I'm talk. back. Thank okay, you. thank you so much, Brenda. Thank you. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Take care.